I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Got your Bibles, go ahead and turn me to Psalm 130. Man, what a privilege it has been for us to be able to be in the Psalms for the Lord, truly showing up in our lives, especially when we need Him the most. Past few weeks, we've taken a look at Psalms where there is a despair and there is a crying out. And we talked about how the enemy loves to derail us, get us off with entering in and removing from us really the joy, the joy of salvation. And we've taken a look at Psalm 13 a couple weeks ago, Psalm 142 last week. This morning is Psalm 130. And there is going to be another crying out, but it's very different than what was taking place before. Before it was about circumstances, sometimes things we cannot control, pressure from the outside. Here comes a cry of desperation from our own failures, from sin. And in fact, the Psalm begins with a tremendous panic. A panic of the fact that there's a realization of, man, God is holy and I am not. What do we do? What do we do in that moment where we realize that we are going to be called on account of our actions and stand before a holy God? How are we going to survive? In the honor of God's word, if you're able and willing, I'd love for you to stand this morning. Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits And in his word, I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, we humbly come before you knowing that we are guilty, knowing that we are in need of your forgiveness and that, Lord Jesus, you are our Savior. Lord, may we truly know the fullness of your forgiveness. May we truly know that new life that you've called us into. Lord Jesus, may we know your salvation and, Lord Jesus, may we know the abundance of who you are. Lord, do a mighty work in us and through us, and we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I mean, let's come back to Psalm 130 and verses one and two. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. The words that are used here are literally to describe a moment of panic. And a moment of panic in deep waters. That's what he's talking about, depths he's talking about. He's talking about this deep water, this moment of panic, a need of rescue. Man, I get this. I resonate with this. I, I can't stand deep water. That scares me to death. And here it is, this moment where he's talking about the deep waters and the deep waters created by our own sin, by our own failures, something we don't like to face, something we don't really like to talk about. And because of that, there's been a loss of seriousness of sin. James Montgomery Boyce writes this upon the screen. We need to recover a sense of sin. We need to discover how desperate our condition is apart from God. We need to know that God's wrath is not an outmoded theological construct, but a terrible and impending reality. We need to come out of our sad fantasy world and begin to tremble before the awesome holiness of our almighty judge. 
sin is real. And if we're honest, we begin to understand and we begin to own our own failures. And because we're talking about sin, automatically there is this tremendous fear that takes place among all of us. Why? Because we automatically walked in here and we carried with us guilt of past sin. We're now living currently within a panic of current sins. And there's a tremendous fear and paranoia about our future sin. It's real and it is destroying us. And until you understand the seriousness of sin, you really will not understand the fullness of the psalm because look at verse number three. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? The psalmist is saying, Lord, if you brought us to an account, that's what it means to mark our iniquities. Our Lord knows. He's been watching. He knows fully. If he calls us upon the carpet, if he says now it's time to give an account, he asks the question, who could stand before you, Lord? The answer is that nobody. No one could stand before a holy God. No one could stand upon their own merit and be redeemed to have, be freed from the power of sin, to be saved. No one has the payment price within ourselves. But yet there's still this, this diminishing of the importance and the overwhelming weight a sin. And there's been moments in my life where the Lord has taught me lessons about the seriousness of sin. One of those took place when Alice and I were first married and I was called to be a pastor of Long Ridge Baptist Church in Owenton, Kentucky. And that church there had a parsonage and we lived on Highway 127 up there in Owen County. If some of you may even know where that is. And we loved it. The Lord blessed us there and we were leading this, this church and living in this parsonage without any children. And so we decided, man, it's time to go buy a kid, you know? So we went and bought a dog, you know what I'm saying? Have you ever done that? I mean, like, man, we need a family. So we went and bought it, this beautiful dog. We love this dog, cherish this dog. And there came a moment where we had a late Wednesday night and the, the dog was still a puppy and we let the dog out to do its business. And we started, got into a conversation. It was late at night, raining outside and vent, vent, the dog didn't come back immediately. So we're like wondering where, where's the dog? And we we're gonna look for the dog. And man, a tragedy took place in our home. The dog found its way upon the highway and, man, and, and a, a car hit it and, and lost its life. And I come back carrying this dog and Allison, of course, is just sobbing in tears. And we were just devastated and took that dog to the backyard and buried that dog. And it's like our house went into a, a mourning for the next like three days. I mean, it was really just like a desperate situation. So I did what any good husband would do. I went and bought another dog. And so I <laughs> brought this dog. Now this dog will live 13 years, really good life. Just wanted the heads up on that one. So like, but like brought this other dog into our home and began to like, you know, hopefully bring us out of this this morning and, and cherish this other dog and everything was going super well until the new dog started walking into the house. And I mean, with a wretched, like ungodly smell upon this dog. And man, I realized that, shoot, that new dog's starting to get into the dead dog, you know? And I'm like, oh man. And so I started trying to rebury, right? You know what I'm saying? Like put concrete on it and try, you know, tell that dog, no, don't get into that. You know, like, you know, be a big, really good father. And so, but the all of a sudden, body parts start showing up, right? I mean, like, it gets, I mean, it got to the point where I know you guys are feeling it with me. I appreciate that. So, like, I mean, we are to the point of great desperation. And I said, Allison, we, we, we got to dig up that dead dog. Like, we're going to have to dig up that dog and rebury it on the outside of the fence line. You, hear, you, heard, you hope you heard that the eye went to we real fast. And so, here we are. Babe, we got to do this thing together. And so, we're out there. I mean, we look like straight up bandits. I mean, it's like, we got, like, the, the cloth around us, you know, in order to like, you know, try to not smell it too bad. And you may not know this, but I don't do well with smells, okay? So we're digging this thing up and I'm literally retching on the, the whole other side of the, of the yard. And I'm just yelling out, babe, you're the only one who can do this, you know? And like, <laughs> and <laughs> she's so mad. Like she threw that shovel down and she goes, you are the worst husband in the world. And I said, babe, I know, but you got to dig this dead dog up, you know? Like, <laughs> so she's digging this dog. And I mean, like we finally got into like, you know, plastic dragging this thing outside the fence line, reburying it. I mean, it was a major ordeal. And then the Lord spoke. How many of us are trying to bury sin? How many of us are trying to erase histories on our computers? And we're trying to manage what we know is killing us. 
And sin, sin is the stench of death. And it's all over us. It's destroying you. It's destroying me. It's destroying marriages. And we are going to have to give an account to a holy God about the sinful, wretched things we've done. And you can't bury it. And it always comes back on you. Always. I'm so tired of hearing people in ministry who are trying to bury things. It always comes back. The scripture says, as a fool returns to his volley, folly, so a, a dog returns to its vomit. We always go back. We're wretched and we are in need of a redeemer, of a savior. That's the depths of Psalm 130. Lord, hear my cry, my pleas for mercy. I'm guilty. I'm sinful. I'm carrying the weight of shame and I can't get it off me. That's the voice of desperation here. That's the despair that's happening in Psalm 130. And he turns to the Lord. That's why verse number four is called good news. Look at verse number four. But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Did you hear that phrase? Did you hear the truth of God's word? But with you, There is forgiveness. There is redemption. There is a removal of our sin as far as the east is from the west. There is the power in the Lord to clean us, make us new. Did you hear the good news? And I'm gonna give you, and we're gonna dig into this phrase, but with you there's forgiveness. I'm giving you seven, I'm giving you seven aspects of this phrase, and I'm giving you scripture references for every one of them. So if you're taking notes, which I know all of you are, here's number one. One, forgiveness belongs to God and is his character. Our Lord seeks us out to bestow upon us his grace. Why? Because it's who he is. According to Exodus 34, I gave you a reference up there. That's when God revealed himself to Moses, revealed his glory, and within it, he gave a clarity of his character. He is voicing out who his character is, and his character is about grace and steadfast love and forgiveness that our Lord, it belongs to him, and he longs to bestow it upon us. That's why in verse number, the point number two is important. God's forgiveness begins and establishes an eternal relationship with him. I gave you a reference of Ephesians 2. Why? Because Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, we are dead in our sin and our trespasses. What does that mean? Dead men cannot make any decisions. This is not, there's forgiveness with the Lord. And oh, by the way, Lord, I'm going to take you up on your offer and I'm going to walk down this aisle and receive your forgiveness. Yes, that happens. Why? Because the Lord brings us alive. He's the one that initiates the relationship. He's the one that draws us. He's the one that goes and rescues us out of our filth. Our Lord in his character is redeemer. And he comes for us and he establishes a relationship, a love relationship that, is that, that endures for eternity. He's the one that starts it. He's the one that creates it. He's the one that makes it possible. Why? Because it is who he is. Hear that good news. You are, it's not in you to turn to the Lord. It's the Lord that comes and rescues us and brings us out of those depths He is a redeemer and a rescuer. He's made it possible. Number three, God's forgiveness is limitless, meaning it covers every every and any sin that you can commit. There's not a sin that he cannot forgive. You and your eye may be sitting here, but no, you don't even know what I've done. Trust me, I don't want to, I don't even want to know what you've done, but I'm telling you, I know that the Lord can forgive you. He has the power to forgive you fully and completely. And there's nothing that he cannot reach into and pull you out of. You are not beyond his power and his grace. That's why number four, 
is amazing. God's forgiveness is yesterday, today, and forever. Why do I give that to you? Why? Because in his forgiveness, he does. He has the power to forgive and to pay the price of all of our past guilt that we've been carrying. All of those failures, all of those dumb decisions, all of that wretchedness and iniquity and wickedness. He's able to forgive of our past failures. He's able to forgive us in the here and now, the things that we are currently engaged in. He's able to get us out and to free us. And he has paid our price for our future. I strategically used that phrase, yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Because that belongs to a person. His name is Jesus. And Jesus is yesterday, today, and forever. And he, because he has come for us, and he has paid our price upon the cross, he has the power to forgive our past, our present, and our future. Why? Because he has defeated sin and death. He is forever. We have a savior who lives and longs for us to know the newness of life in him. Number five, God's forgiveness is fully available now. According to 1 John 1, 9, we confess to the Lord Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our Lord is available now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to put it off. You don't have to try to earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do but receive it as a gift because it's exactly what it is. But with him, there is forgiveness. It's available now. Number six is God's forgiveness leads us to godly living. Take a look at the back of the scripture. Take a look at me in verse number four again. But with him, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. That word fear, biblical fear, is about awe and reverence. It's about worship. It's not talking about fear that we have in our world where we talk about being scared. No, this is about awe and worship. What does God's forgiveness do? It leads us to a holy life. Why? Because it's a gift. And when we receive a gift, a gift of value, we are not so foolish to where we take that gift of value and that we begin to take advantage of it. No, we cherish it. Like the Lord's just given us the greatest gift, the gift of his forgiveness. It leads us to holiness, a desire and a passion to want to know him, a desire and a passion to worship him and to be in a right relationship with him. How do we know that? Take a back look, look back at me in the scripture. Take a look at verses five and six. The scripture says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. This is describing a relationship. That word wait is not the way we interpret wait where we are get impatient, like we're waiting in line. That's not what he's talking about. It has more to do with anticipation, with eagerness. Lord, I'm anticipating you. I'm eagerly looking for you. You brought me into a relationship and Lord, I long for you. When the Lord, when we surrender to him, when we confess our sin, when he blesses us with his forgiveness, I mean, there's a relationship that's established, a relationship that he gives to us. And it's a love relationship where we begin to long for him. And we're based this, what? Look, it says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I hope. It's in the word of God. I don't hope based upon my feelings. I don't, I don't hope based upon my performance. I hope based upon the word of God, that God has spoken to us, that he's given us promises. And we base that relationship upon him, that when he says there's forgiveness in him, I trust him. It's based upon his word, his great promises. He's communicating his love to you and to me. We did this last week, did we not, Valentine's Day? Did you not take the opportunity to try to communicate to someone in your life how much you love them. How did you communicate? You communicated by falling into American consumerism and communicated through, you guys can laugh, come on, goodness, cards, right? Flowers, gifts. You fell into it, why? Because you wanted to communicate something to someone else about how special they are. Did you think for a moment that someone wouldn't get it? or they wouldn't understand. When you said to them, man, I love you, did you think somehow they would think something else? No, why? Because you were communicating through your word and that carried with it meaning. Our Lord is communicating to us in and through his word. If we know how to communicate, how much more does he? 
And he's communicating his perfection and his love. He's communicating his redemption and he's communicating his forgiveness. He's communicating his grace to us. He's communicating about what it looks like to follow him, to wait, to be in eager anticipation. Because look at verse number six. My soul waits for the Lord more, more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. His longing, he's describing how much he longs for the Lord more than the watchman who is standing in a tower looking out upon a dark field for protection. And he's saying, I'm longing more for you than the morning Lord. Why? Because in that watchtower, it's lonely, it's dark, it's cold. I mean, you're just waiting for that sun to come up. Why? Because there's relief, there's safety. Man, there's newness with that rising of that sun. And he's saying, I'm longing for you more than the sun that comes up in the morning, more than the watchman waits for the morning. My heart longs for you. That's what his forgiveness does. I mean, it establishes a relationship, a love relationship where we long for the Lord. That's how you know the Lord's at work in your life. You want more of him. You're longing for him. You want to know him. You want to fall in love with him. And then you want other people to know about the Lord. Take a look at the scriptures. Look at verse number seven. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there's a steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. That's why number seven, the point number seven I'm giving to you is God's forgiveness gives us an overwhelming desire to share him. That's why I give you that reference of Acts 1.8, that we are called upon to be his witnesses and we are called upon to know him and to make him known. That's what verse seven and eight is communicating. There's a, such an experience of the Lord that he wants now, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption. Now remember though, remember that when the psalmist is writing this, they are, they're in a sacrificial system. I mean, have you ever taken the time to read through, and I, this, for whatever reason, the Lord's got me in the book of Numbers right now and I've been reading through the whole sacrificial system, the cleansing the sacrifices, just go read Numbers 28 through 30. I was so overwhelmed in reading the complexity, how serious it is, how much sacrifices had to be made and when they had to be made. I was so overwhelmed that I said, Jesus, I'm so thankful for you because our Lord in a great anticipation fulfills all of this. He is plentiful redemption. Verse number eight says, and he will, a future aspect, redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The psalmist is looking for that Messiah. He's looking for that savior. He's looking for the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we have the beautiful luxury of knowing that savior has arrived. That savior did live a perfect, sinless life. That savior went to the cross, took upon a punishment that we deserve. It was our sin that he paid. He, it was our punishment that he took upon himself. He paid our price so that we would know his forgiveness, that we would be freed from the bondage of sin and now live for his kingdom and his glory. Is that how we're living? Man, are we living in such a love relationship with the Lord where we are so longing for others to know who he is? Do we know just how special he really is? Paul, gave us a description from, literally, flowing from Psalm 130. Look at Romans 3, 23 through 26, up on the screen here for you. Paul writes this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Very similar to Psalm 130. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now I know that's a huge word, but propitiation basically means that the Lord took upon the wrath of God for you and me. And because he took upon the wrath of God by his sacrifice, he's now able to extend mercy to us. That's what it means. To be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does it mean? It means that sin has a price. 
And someone has to pay that price. And that's why he's able to be called just. Why? Because he paid our price in the death of the son of God. That is the price that was paid for you and me. That's why he's able to say he is just. And now he's able to say that he's the justifier of those who place their faith in Christ. Why? Because your price has been paid. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why we are able to say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Because we were in that desperation. We were in that depths of sin and we cried out for pleas with mercy and he welcomes us into his home because our price has been paid. We've been forgiven. And now what a privilege it is to say, I want others to know him. He changes us. That's what his forgiveness does. It changes us. He doesn't leave us where we are. He doesn't just get us. You heard that commercial. He saves us. And there's a huge difference in that. He didn't come just to identify and leave us where we are. He came to redeem us and bring us out of that life of sin and to make us new in him and to give a witness of his power and his grace. That's who we are supposed to be. To give honor to our Lord. Our lives should be giving honor to him even in the midst of opposition. Acts chapter five, up on the screen. This is the disciples. They were speaking out. They were thrown in prison. We pick it up in verse number 25. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in, in this name. Yet here you are, have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must be, obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at, at his right hand as leader and savior to give, this is fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 130, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Our hope is in his word and in his promise. And he fulfills his promise. He's made Psalm 130 real in and through Christ. And we now have the privilege of knowing the forgiveness of sin by our Lord and living in the newness of life. The question is, are we? Are we living in Christ? Have we allowed him so to change us where we now living the new life that he has promised? Or are we busy trying to hide and bury sin? The Lord wants to free you this morning. He has the power to free you this morning. Will you Confess your sin before him. Will you allow him to make you clean and new? And will you surrender your life never to return to that junk and to honor his great and holy name? Those promises are true. And you have the opportunity to respond to him. Oh man, let's pray together this morning. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great promises. Lord Jesus, thank you that there is forgiveness with you. With all his bowed and all his closed. Listen to the psalmist again. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Lord Jesus, please meet us where we are. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter what we've thought, Lord Jesus, you have the power to forgive us. 
you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, whose name is above every name, because you have come for us. You have paid our price upon the cross. You defeated sin and death in and through the resurrection. Lord Jesus, you live. And so can we. Because you've invited us in. Lord Jesus, may we truly confess before you and be changed, be made clean, to take that stench of death off of us, take those stains of sin off of us, and to be new in you, to be free. Lord Jesus, please give us the strength to believe and the strength to respond this morning. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.